مصطفى المصطفى المختار الحبيب الذي كان بشرا بذاته ينتظر سفينته في مدينة أورفيليس من كتاب النبي شكرا Welcome to the Shakti Hour podcast on Ramdas's Be Here Now Network. I'm your host, Melanie Moser, and today we continue our Shakti Sacred Music series, conversations with musicians about sacred music and the feminine voice. My guest is Kave Nabatian, filmmaker and musician and trumpet player in the band Bell Orchestra. Kave and I met many years ago and have been in and around each other's lives uh, ever since. I find him to be an incredibly inspiring artist and musician and traveler of the globe and speaker of many languages. So it was really a treat to get to sit with him and talk about spirituality and music. He brought in a piece by Lebanese singer Fayrouz, and we got into some interesting insights around communal experience of music and how that itself can be a spiritual practice. I hope that you're enjoying the series and you're sharing it with your friends. Please remember to subscribe to the Shakti Hour on iTunes and leave us a rating and review. You can also follow along at shaktisacredmusic.com where you'll find the full songs of the music featured on the Sacred Music series including music from the guests in their personal projects and more information on the spiritual paths of both the featured artists and Shakti Hour guests. You can also join in at Shakti Hour uh, Patreon page to become a subscriber and have access to the unedited interviews in this series. As always, everything can be found at the BeHereNowNetwork.com Shakti Hour page and thank you so much for listening. What, so what do you have queued up for us to listen to? So we're going to listen to Feruz off the album, The Legendary Feruz, and it's a live version of the song Beirut al-Zarafat. There's a lot of radio stations that the first thing they play every day is a Feru's song or an Umkaltum song. Um, and there are Feru's in particular, her voice is super beautiful and really speaks to me. And I think is really interesting is that she she sang about the Arabic world. So despite the fact that she was Lebanese, she would sing about Egypt and like she has a song about Egypt and a song about, you know, Beirut and a song about Kuwait and so she she had this kind of thing where she'd bring together all the Arabic world despite all of its you know problems and interfighting and stuff as this like with this idea of this like one kind of people and this one kind of music there's something about the way the music functions to allow that female voice to soar with all of this power that huh. it's kind of like opens this gate for these women to like you know just kind of let loose with this like emotion and and ferocity that I find really fascinating. And she, do you say that the the radio stations play that first on the in the day? Yeah, you know, like after the call to prayer. I, famously, there's one. I think it's you know one of the big stations in Beirut. Like for the last whatever forty years, has played a Feru song the first thing after the first call to prayer. It's like how people start their day. And same with Um Kaltum and other radio stations. I think there's kind of a, a somewhat of a rivalry between the two of them. Um, but Feruz's voice is far more, like Um Kaltum is really intense and kind of harsh and definitely worth listening to. Feruz is more uh, kind of emotional and there's a certain elegance to it, but it still sounds very much like 
you know, it's not like elegant in a European way. It's elegant in an Arabic way. And what does she sing about? Well, I said, I don't really speak Arabic, but she sings, I mean, a lot of the songs, I, I don't know really how heavy the lyrics are. I think it's a lot about the experience of living in the Middle East and of being an Arab in the, in the Middle East and kind of like about how great Kuwait is and how great Beirut is. And, you know, I think it's a lot about like, although she also sings some stuff um, based on Khalil Gibran, Gibran, I don't know actually how you pronounce that, based on the prophet. So there's, you know, she also has certain huh. things that are based on spiritual writing. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if she writes her own songs. I just love the sound of her voice. And when I was in Egypt and Jordan a few years ago, it was like wherever I went, you know, the, people were always a little suspicious of like, he was this white dude. What's he doing here? Because I like to get into like kind of unusual places. <laughs> but um, I would always have my little Bluetooth speaker with me and I'd just put on Feirouz because it just made so much sense there. And as soon as people heard Feirouz, they'd, they were my best friend because I was like, okay, you get us if you like Feirouz. Right? I see. <laughs> but the call said so that the call to prayer is men singing. Yeah. And, Definitely. and, and uh, theoretically they're not, it's not singing, you know, it's not right. it's supposed to be art, but I mean, yeah, I'm really not an expert on, 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 on Feirouz or on Arabic music really. But it, for me, it was just, I heard this when I was in Egypt and it just blew my mind open. There's something about her voice. And there's, you know, like I'm, I'm of Persian descent, which is in a lot of ways very far from the Arabic world, but also it's right next to it, you know. Hmm. Um, so there's something about the, those orchestrations and those scales that they're using, those modes that speaks to me very, very much. But it doesn't sound like Persian music. So, it, it, you know, just kind of turned my ear on to, to a new sound. Yeah. Pretty cool song. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody give you a cue into why that's like the start after prayer? Well, I think the idea is that it's, I don't know that it's related to the call to prayer per se. It's more related to like, how do you want to start your day? You want uh. to start your day with Feirouz. You know, it's like, it's just a good way to start anything. Is, right. Is with Feirouz. <laughs> is it, yeah. Okay. And, it, and, it, and it's that feeling of, yeah, of like this kind of unity across countries that I think is, or across, or across cultures, to me anyway, that's what it seems like is, to me anyway, that is what it seems like is the most, uh, as an outsider, the strongest thing is that whether I was in Egypt or Jordan, who historically have a lot of rivalries, you put on Feirouz and people go nuts. And it, including, like, I went into the south of Egypt where it's Nubian, so, you know, black Egyptians, and they're seen as, you know, dirty by northern egyptian there's like a whole you know there's a lot of racial yeah. issues in egypt and whether it's coptic christians or nubians or arab egypts egyptians they pharaohs is like this binding force that huh. and there's something about that like i don't know they'd be like i don't know it'd be like if every day everyone listened to elvis in the morning or something I mean, <laughs> but but also if but it across cultures too or you know like i don't think we really have that and maybe the the Beatles in Europe, but even then still there's so much division between different countries and in the cultures, you know, like I don't know if Hungarians, were, but actually Hungarians probably were listening to the Beatles all the time, but you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> there's this kind of thing about this pan Arabic experience that seems that I find really interesting. 
I can see why it would be the way to start your day because it's this, it's like a, a, a gentle little river lifting you into <laughs> the flow of your life. Yeah. And another thing that I think is really interesting about her is that, I mean, aside from like the very intro and the very outro of that song in particular, that bum, 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 like it's like this kind of march thing. Yeah. But then once it gets going, there's something that's quite mournful about it, but it's not sad mournfulness. You know, it's like, it, there's a, I mean, it, it's partly just that mode, that, that scale that they're using sounds like, like in quotations, sad to the Western ear. But there's also her voice, you know, like, she sings super loudly and super quietly in that, but there's so much vocal control. And it's also, there's always this kind of like, I guess plaintive more than mournful. There's like, there's this, there's this like kind of, uh, it feels like there's this kind of like cry out to me in, in it. I don't know if you were getting that at all. Well, it, I get it, but it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And right. I think that that's where I was like, really like working harder than I needed to listening to it. Um, I could feel that mm -hmm. kind of tension of the bandwidth kind of crunched in there, mm -hmm. but she's such an expert mm -hmm. that it almost, um, almost made me uncomfortable because um, it wasn't really expressing that mm. feeling. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I, and so the context that you gave it with the, you know, the culture and then the space that it sits in the day yeah, and the way that you would get like an instant street cred for <laughs> for having that as part of your listening. Yeah, um, it it didn't make me sad, but it almost made me it made me curious about you know what she does when she's off duty, mm. like because that's such an expert an expert dial. Mm -hmm. of emotion an expert dial of restraint i mean in the in the in the vocal control like you said is bananas yeah because there could you could be having that call out of you like that that mode those could call out of you you know and i'm thinking to the to the um female cantor that we listened to in one of the first episodes like those those are some really crazy modes and and scales that are in there but there's the whole thing is moved by emotion the whole thing is moved by feeling yeah 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 and this is that like yeah and like put in this way yeah where i can't wait to listen to it again i can't wait to listen to more really and yeah. like feel out like find the feeling of it mm-hmm What's interesting to me, like at one point I considered looking up the lyrics, but I chose not to because I kind of don't really want to know because it, it, it works on its own hmm. to me. So so I don't know really what the emotional content is supposed to be of what, you know, what she's, I know that she's singing about Beirut. I mean, imagine it's something, you know, about how beautiful and it is and how sad the sad things are and, you know, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, but the way that music functions to me, the, the fact that there's such an intricate, interplay between the voice and the orchestra but it's clear that the orchestra is there purely to service the voice to create a space for the voice to do what it does is really interesting to me because in an, another kind of music you know you could take the vocal out especially in like one of these chorus verse chorus verse chorus bridge things and it's like oh that's the instrumental of the blonde redhead song or the beatles song and it, like it you know it wouldn't work as well without the voice but it would still work right this kind of music is the, the orchestration is much more intense than it often would be in like Western pop music, but it is only there to serve the voice. You know what I mean? Exactly. Got it. Right. Because it is, it is like the same. Like they're the same. Yeah. They're not, one is, they're mixed. They're kind of running right alongside of one another. Exactly, yeah. Except that this powerful, however many piece orchestra is in service to the voice completely. Yeah. Because there's there was no like instrumental section of. Well, I mean, there are little bits that are instrumental, right. but it's kind of like the whole purpose of them is so that when she comes in, she comes in even harder. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> and how how does that like fit 
in terms of the your vibe. I know this isn't your your personal spiritual path, but how does it fit in terms of the vibe of what you see as the spiritual or cultural or what you experienced as the spiritual or cultural overtones of mm. where you heard it? Like, do you see it having, I mean, it, you ha it already has this placement in relationship to the call to prayer, but mm. how does it relate spiritually? Well, I think that and this isn't really only, you know, limited to the Arabic world, but people, I think a lot of the function of music is to provide a spiritual escape from, you know, day-to-day -day life. And, and the reality is that, it, especially in a place like Beirut that had, you know, went through so much war and all this stuff, or, or the Arabic world in general, the Middle East in general, it's never been an easy place, even, you know, <laughs> for ever, you know? <laughs> so I think that this kind of music it's so dreamy and so beautiful that it creates this this place to to escape from your your daily troubles and and I, you know and that makes it sound like it's almost like reductive but i think that's such an important thing is yeah. to to be able to like go into this really beautiful place and it's not like you're i mean not that there's anything wrong with listening to top 40 dance music to escape but there but this space that she creates is this very particular space and the idea that everyone kind of goes into this space together i think has a spiritual dimension to it right and that it isn't religious per se right that it that it is this complement to that mm -hmm. adds another level of spirituality to it because it's because it's for everyone mm -hmm. absolutely and and yeah. that it's for that it's for christian cops and you know Arab, like Muslim Arab, it's like it's really, it, it's not limited by culture or religion, but it creates this. I mean, I think when music functions at its best, it creates a spiritual space for people to go to get together. But like with someone like my band, realistically, whoops, realistically, <laughs> um, nobody is the, like the kind of people who are going to listen to my music, whether I like it or not are all kind of the same. You know, like they're hipster <laughs> yeah. hipstery, like people who like weirdo, cool music. Yeah. It's not like I'm appealing to, I mean, we were talking about the difference between bi-coastal people and Midwestern people, like how there's this big difference. Like people in the Midwest mostly aren't listening to my music. Whereas it, the, the equivalent with Feroz is like people who are poor and people who are super rich and people who are educated and uneducated, all of them are listening to her. And that, there's something very unifying about that, I think. Right. Right. Having a secular, unifying, spiritual experience is something really cool. Like you said, I mean, that's, and that it's a, and that it's a woman's voice, especially in that culture is, is, um, really deep. Yeah. And in a, yeah, in a culture where women's voices aren't often heard in the public sphere, the, the most public voices musically that we hear our, our women's voices is I mean I think it speaks to the fact that their voices aren't necessarily heard in the public sphere as often right I mean not not to in any way imply that women in the Middle East are not strong because they're like the strongest women I've ever met but like you don't <laughs> necessarily in, at least in certain countries you, they're not at the forefront of politics or at the forefront you know then there's a lot of repression and all this stuff and the fact that it's Feruz and Umkaltum every morning just blasting out and every night I mean it's everywhere you hear it just everywhere Right. Yeah. I I feel like that could be really valuable for us. You know, to have culturally integrated spiritual experiences. <laughs> and um and and you know, like I think of Sesame Street in the US the television show. I don't even know. If, do you know yeah, Sesame no, Street? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I think of that coming out of the 60s, which is this moment that I consider to be this time when there was, a, there was a counterculture spiritual moment, right? That then entered into the cultural, <laughs> mainstream cultural landscape through these different things. So like Sesame Street was this place where a lot of us got kind of the remnants of that moment, which was counterculture, right? Mm. <laughs> it still wasn't mainstream, right? Which is something that I was 
talking to some of the Ram Dass satsang about uh, about a month ago, and and they were pointing out to me they're like, yeah, but they thought we were like clowns, like you know, in that time they're like the acid taking hippies. They mm. thought like mainstream culture thought we were like right. clowns and like goofballs. Right. And now it's just now that this has become like that yoga and Ramdas and mindfulness and this stuff is now in a mainstream level. Right. But I think that there's some value in in having good spiritual ideas embedded in in culture. And so this is kind of almost the inverse of it. Mm. <laughs> in that in that the the spiritual quote unquote values in this culture are ha are hammered in like mm. they are built in right right and then this is kind of the <laughs> this is kind of the i mean gosh i mean i don't want to make a commentary on religion but this is kind of the thing that i'm talking about right. like coming in around that it's yeah. like okay we did the prayer we have our organized society <laughs> yeah we have all these restrictions now here's this moment where we all join the flow together that's so cool yeah but you know how to get it how to get that like like you said people i mean what when you're talking about your music you're talking about bell orchestra so, yeah so or, yeah. or other stuff that i've done yeah. yeah yeah so like how to get that level of awareness <laughs> across america and to turn people on that would be kind of cool yeah it'd be amazing i don't know if it's possible i mean i guess there's beyonce i think everybody likes beyonce even in the midwest right <laughs> or maybe not. maybe you know not, i don't know anything about the midwest so i can't <laughs> <laughs> i can't comment on that and i mean and she's talking about important stuff but it's it's more political there's something about the fact that that music like I mean, I'm sure a lot of it is political. Again, I'm kind of talking out of my ass because I don't really know what she's singing about. <laughs> but from the reactions I got to playing and from the way people were listening to it, it's not, it's not hammering, it's not propaganda, it's not, like, it's not pro one party or not against another party. It's, it's, like creating this, it's, it's about creating a space for everyone to, to get into together. And, yeah. and I don't know what the equivalent even could be in Western pop music or Western music period, you know. Right. I mean, it doesn't even really lend itself to that because, you know, the A, B, A, B, C, A, B, A yeah. structure <laughs> yeah. kind of holds holds you to a storyline or yeah. or something. And, and the and like a major minor mm -hmm. chord setup is going to dictate your experience. I mean, if you're in a major C, G, D situation, you're creating one emotion if you're in a minor you're creating another yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah this is vast yeah yeah you yeah. can really source yourself in it yeah well to me it's not unrelated also to like the modal music of the 50s and 60s and jazz you know like if you listen to kind of blue or whatever mm. it's kind of the same thing like the band's laying down this it's, it's almost like slowly shifting tectonic plates is how i think of it you know it's like these like slowly moving mm. uh chord structures but they aren't they're not jumping all over the place the way they had been earlier in jazz and and then miles's trumpet can soar over it or you mm. know right and in that way that's like a really a really beautiful testament to like the individual and the group um so tell me a little bit about your own relationship to um spirit and and music i know i know a little bit about your personal spiritual religious upbringing but how how does how does this whole thing sit with you <laughs> like this this idea of sacred music or spiritual music or that holding that mm. uh well for me i mean i think really all music is sacred and it's just a question of whether you name it or not. And I think that often when you do name it, it brings a certain amount of intensity and energy to the music. But I think at the end of the day, that's what it all is about, is creating these sacred spaces. And when you're playing music well, it's when you're getting out of the way 
of the sacred to blow through you through you you know it's not you're not really i don't believe that you're ever really creating it and if you are creating it you're probably not playing very good music do you know what i mean like it's it's i often think of it like like a vocal cord like if you don't breathe through your vocal cords you can't make any sound the vocal cords are your own but the breath is god the breath is is the spirit it's the universe right. you know what i mean so so i think the the goal is to get your technique up to whatever level you can and then to just get out of the way so that the spirit can take the music where the spirit wants to go and if it's chosen you to do that it's choosing you to do it in your particular way you know like so so not that all music like not that the same spirit would say the same thing through two different people i think that they choose they choose which person they're going to blow their their music through you know what i mean <laughs> Yeah, who's they? The spirit. They're the spirits. Yeah, <laughs> right. The spirits, God, the universe, whatever, whatever people are calling it these days. Right. Well, I mean, I do think it's worth it to to say. You know, first you said God, you said the breath, you said spirit, then you said multiple spirits, then you said they, and I think that um, there's a lot to that, honestly, <laughs> mm -hmm. in terms of in terms of religious belief and like where that belief comes from can you say more about where that where your flexibility around <laughs> that language comes from sure yeah <laughs> i mean i grew up unitarian which is like someone called it the uh the pescatarians of <laughs> of religion where you you can kind of believe in god if you want but you don't have to and you learn a lot about a lot of different religions um so i think i grew up like kind of aware of a bigger spirit than what was going on in that church but i didn't really have a place to put it and then mm. my brother and i became introduced to sufism mm. um in a very powerful way and he went on to become to study sufism and mm. divinity school at harvard and become a sufi chaplain and like sufism is that really like took over his life in a lot of ways he married the only other sufi at harvard which was, at the time that he was there which i think is really <laughs> cute <laughs> Um, and it also took me on quite a journey, although I didn't really be, I didn't convert or anything. But then I, soon after I was introduced to Sufism, I went to Africa and was spending a lot of time in Senegal and in Senegal, they have a, a kind of Sufism called the Bifals. And I spent a lot of time at Bifal things and learning Bifal rhythms and all this kind of stuff. Um, and there they, you know, everyone was trying to get me to convert and, but I didn't, it didn't, just, something didn't feel quite right. And then uh, I was in Cuba researching a film uh, about a, an Afro-Cuban ballet dancer. And so one of the things I needed to learn about was his relationship to spirituality. And so, in, and so I wanted to learn about Centuria. So I met a, a cab driver who was also a, a Babalao, which is, I guess, like a Centuria priest. And I went and hung out with him, and he did a reading for me. And it, the reading was like spot on it was really weird and um uh, and he encouraged me to become initiated and i was like there's something about those afro-cuban rhythms and that culture that really i was drawn to so and and i was you know i was like well what the hell <laughs> so so i became initiated into centuria which was extremely intense um and in centuria you've got as in like Haitian voodoo and um, and Brazilian candomblé, you've got all these different deities that represent different forces. You know, so like Chango is the god of fire and lightning. Uh, Oya is the goddess of change and wind and shooting stars. Um, Oshun is the goddess of fertility and rivers and honey and all that stuff. You know, it goes on forever. It's not not unlike other pantheons of Greek mythology or Native American or whatever. Um, and and so I've, you know, as someone who's initiated, I have to do certain things for my orishas, they're called. And those rituals keep me in touch with, with that religion. And, but because I also like went, took this big detour via Sufism, I'm really quite convinced that it's all the same, you know? And like, I think for me, the important thing is to be doing something and to have some sort of for me, the, the rituals are actually quite important and it doesn't really matter which one you choose because it's the ritual that keeps you in touch with that spirit or those spirits. And, and I think 
Like I don't I don't really think there's a dude named Elegua at every crossroad helping me to make decisions, but I believe in the spirit of Elegua and I believe that they're that like spending time praying to Elegua or doing a sacrifice for Elegua or whatever can help open doors or help me understand what to do at a crossroads. And the, and I also don't believe that there's like some dude in the sky with a big beard named God, but I <laughs> but there's things about the about Christianity that I think are super beautiful and and when you meet really Christians who are deep into it and in a really beautiful, pure way, I mean, you can feel the light emanating from them. And so I, I, for me, there's really no hierarchy between the religions. I think that when you tap in, you're, you're, everyone's tapping into the same spirit or spirits. And it's just kind of how you, the nomenclature changes from one to another. The spirit or spirits makes sense to me now because we're talking about when you say it multiple, it's multiple from the one through the different access points. Exactly, yeah. Okay, great. So then I was just kind of searching a, a bunch, and then and then when I found the Bifalls in Senegal, I was you know really excited about it, and and then felt those same feelings again. But it, there's just something you know. I feel like you know where you're supposed to go somewhere inside you, and, mm. and it's like, well, I'm not spiritually. Yeah, like I don't. Yeah. It's like I'm not going to move to Senegal and become a bifollower realistically. Like, am I going to convert to Islam? I don't know. This doesn't, there's something about it that didn't quite make sense, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, it, but, it, but that whole experience really turned me on to the idea of spirituality and religion. And, and, and I mean, I'd always thought that, that stuff was important and I'd always kind of known it was out there, but I needed something to latch on to in order to do it. Like, you know, you, if you're, you have to meditate every day if you want to get, if, if meditation is important, you can't just think meditation is a cool idea and never do it. <laughs> right. You know, and so. The Unitarian experience that I had adjacent to you when mm -hmm. we first met, what I got from the Unitarian Universalists was community, was acceptance, was open mindedness, was open heartedness, which was, which was like just basic goodness and decency to other human beings that's all i took from that was there was that the foundation or was there other spiritual principles that were put in to your mind then i mean were you set on a path to look for a place to sink your teeth in or were you just offered that and then you as an individual were looking for some place to sink your teeth in I mean, I think it set the groundwork f to be interested because it's, you know, it's a very kind of in general intellectual kind of religion in that it, it brings people together, like you say, in community. And sometimes it feels more like a, a really nice community activity than a religion. But, when, you know, like, for example, you, when you go to Sunday school, instead of like being hammered over the head with the Bible, you one of the classes was called Holidays and Holy Days. And every Sunday we'd learn about a holy day from a different huh. religion, huh. which is like the opposite of what most religions do. You know? <laughs> right. and, 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 it, and it becomes kind of like, to me felt like kind of an intellectual pursuit, but an interesting one. It's almost like going to a lecture or a class, mm. but it did make me be interested in, and aware that there was a lot of different ways of looking at the idea of spirituality. And so then, so in that way, it probably opened me to it, but I don't know that it would open another Unitarian to it. You know what I mean? Right, because you could just go along. I mean, as with anybody plugged into any religious system, you can just kind of go along with the thing. Or you're an artist, you're drawn to music, and you're going to tune into these different things as you're being kind of taught <laughs> yeah. that there's possibility out there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. That's helpful. So... Yeah, because I mean, in my Sunday school, it was very, very much I was learning exactly what I was supposed to learn, right? Yeah. And what the story was. And also, I remember, I was just remembering this the other day. We were in a church, um, I guess I must have been like a preteen, and we had moved churches, and the pastor was really, really, really strict. His name was Noel Vold, <laughs> and he still wore like horn room glasses and had like, like greased hair. Buzz cut, yeah. yeah. Well. Anyway, I remember him, I remember like challenging something he said, like innocently, 
I had this memory of saying, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense <laughs> and just getting totally shut down, you know, completely shut down. And then we ended up moving churches and I started playing in like the Lutheran church band at this more like <laughs> liberal church and like started listening to you too and was like, you know, open to <laughs> possibilities. Anyway, so that's a little bit different. You know, it took me a little longer to find the freedom to explore things. And, and even when I was in India, whatever many years ago, six years ago, I still was struck by my resistance to, like ingrained resistance, not actual Melanie's resistance, but like to, you know, worshiping idols. Right. So what I really liked about what you said about practicing ritual as a way that the ritual is actually important to having access to keeping that doorway open. So tell me about what is this thing that you got initiated in? <laughs> <laughs> Santeria is the, it's the main religion of Afro-Cuban people, but like not only Afro-Cubans, many Cubans, I and mean, it's the majority of Cubans are, are Santeria practitioners. And it was, it was like, uh, it was held underground for a lot of time under Fidel. And then at a certain point in the late 80s, Fidel said people are allowed to be Santeros. And and then all of a sudden, you could just see it everywhere, what had been underground. But it's it's um, in the same, yeah, it's the same kind of, a lot of the same people who ended up in Haiti and in Brazil, like is it from Yoruba people. Um, and so they all have their own kind of idea of what, uh, it, you know, like it breaks down in different ways in these different cultures. But, you know, like in in Haiti, there's Papa Legba, who is deals with crossroads. And then in Cuba, his name is Elegua. So even, you know, so you can really see the, uh -huh. or is Yemaya in Cuba is the goddess of the ocean. And uh, in Cuba, it's, and in Brazil, it's Yemenje. You know what I mean? So it, you can see it's like the same, <laughs> It's like an ancient religion, and in Nigeria, it's still practiced as well. Um, and and the slaves brought it over, and the their gods became syncretized with the Catholic gods, the Christian gods. And so the the feast days for the different Christian saints would they'd celebrate their you know their own Orisha at the same time, um, just under the cover of yeah of whatever. Yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, yeah. Saint holiday. It yeah, was, it's like yeah. Saint holiday, and and I can't remember who how they're all syncretized, but each you know every every one of the century orishas has a has a saint, a Christian saint attached to it. Oh, interesting. Um, What's the underlying principle, or 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 what what drew you in? I mean, what made you you went on this journey, and then this guy was like, "I want to initiate you," and you were like, "Oh yeah, okay." <laughs> How did you know that that was the one for you? Uh, was it that that the moment in your life, or was it like the feeling after having sampled these different experiences around the globe that what what turned you on? What made I you think, know it was time? Yeah, no, I think I mean it's a really good question. I think it um, is partly having sampled different ideas. I was like, well, you just got to do one, and this one's being <laughs> presented to you. And I think there's, a, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. I think that I've had issues around fear and fighting fear my whole life, mm. despite the fact that from the outside, it doesn't look like I live a fearful existence. <laughs> there, I've often been scared of stuff. And mm. there's something about when this guy presented this idea, I was like, all right, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? And now, I mean, it's funny because the worst thing that could happen in that religion is and I'm not, I'm, that's, that's an exaggeration, but religion is a funny place to mess around with, like being, like I feel like I have to take care of my stuff in the Santeria world now, or bad stuff could happen, you know? Like, uh -huh. <laughs> whereas like going bungee jumping, is like, ah, oh, you're either dead or you did it, and then it's over, you know? Um, I probably should have just gone bungee jumping. But no, actually it's been really, it's been really nice, you know? Like I travel a lot, and so, I have to do certain things before I travel or when I get back and and it's very like grounding and it makes me think, you know, like when I'm praying to Elegua, who's the God of the crossroads, I think about where I am and what are the crossroads I'm going to have to like 
cross in the next while and how do I want to do it? And so it becomes a little bit less just constantly reactive. You know, and I think there's a lot of different ways you could get to that kind of more meditative state of mind. It could be through meditation or it could be through therapy. Or, but I think, but in, in this case, the, the religion has been helpful for me to, and, and there's like, it also just like aesthetically works for me. You know, like the music, each one of the Orishas has a really intense trance inducing rhythm huh. and the candles and the squash and the honey and the, it, the whole thing just kind of works for me. It just makes sense to me somehow. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more about this fear thing. What does that mean to you to, to deal with fear? Because it's true, you know, uh, I know you, you, you travel the world, you create things, you seem to do what's before you without hesitation. So I think it's, it's um, helpful to share what, that, what, what fear means to you, what the experience of fear is. Mm. Well, I think if I'm honest, a lot of the things I've done in my life have been in reaction to fear, but they weren't necessarily things that came to me naturally. It was like, okay, I'm scared of this. I have to prove to myself that I can do it. And I've had a bunch of times where I've frozen. You know, like I remember once I was, when I was younger, I was skiing down this slope and it was like too steep and I just froze and because I got scared and I smashed into a tree and got a concussion and people were like i don't know what happened you were going fine and then you just stopped <laughs> and i and that is, i think it's partly that it's just like i gotta never stop when i'm scared um and i think you know that and then you kind of fake it till you make it yeah i was traveling a lot and then probably to prove to myself that i could and then it just became my way of living and um but, you know, I, I think I've had massive fear still. Like, I'm 42 and I'm making my first feature film. I think I could have, it was always easy to explain reasons why I wasn't doing it before, but it was also because I was terrified. And now that I'm shooting it in six weeks, I'm, like, super terrified, but it's too late to stop. <laughs> so I'm doing it and I'm, like, got my Orishas going and they're all help, hopefully going to help me out with this. And you know. Right. Right. So I'm kind of connecting it. It's kind of looping around for me now in in listening to the music that we had at the beginning and how that is integrated into the day mm. and how how gent how kind of gentle and like you you know, the space it's kind it's not womb it's not a womb mm. thing but it is like a little bit of a kind of a, a laying out of a of an entrance into the day right so i'm just tapping into this idea of like what is the feeling of fear like i got the frozen thing on the ski slope mm -hmm. that's like a dropping away of consciousness mm -hmm. and and agency right so what does it mean to be in fear mm. i mean i think that stuff is tied to insecurity a lot you know, like I was afraid to commit to relationships. I was afraid to commit to making the movie. I was afraid to commit to a religion. I was just like, I, so it wasn't like I was sitting at home being scared of, you know, ghosts or whatever. It was more just like I, I had a fear of committing to my own life, I think. Huh. And and so that was, so, so, you know, becoming initiated, I was like, well, I'm committing to this thing now and I have to do it. And And so that opened certain doors for me. That for me is definitely my experience of a spiritual life is developing that personal relationship with spirit and that commitment, which is then to the self, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, to your own, your own light and your own life. Yeah. And so what's so beautiful about Ferus, am I saying that right? Ferus, yeah. Ferus, sorry, <laughs> is that she is you know, kind of doing that culturally for everybody. Mm -hmm. So in a place where there's not a lot of choice, there's people that are going to be able to get that from that religious practice. And then there's offering you that space to remember. Yeah. Well, yeah, and offering a space for a community to join together and 
live an experience together you know like I th uh, musicians are basically sh priests they're like shaman you know or sh <laughs> shaw women whatever they're called um and i think in like i can think of so many different kinds of musical experiences i've had whether it's like electronic music or music in morocco or in cuba or in whatever where it's not about and where the music is really filtering through some priest or priestess and everyone's gathered around and feeling it and it feels like you know like what you hear about old crazy you know in medieval england or ancient england all these druids with their like raves and stuff. like it's just a, it's a need that humans have and and uh it's really easy to see how it's done in traditional cultures, but I think we're doing it all the time here. Like people, huh. I, I just uh, got tickets for the Massive Attack show in, in Radio City Music Hall, and uh, they sold out in 20 minutes. Like, there's a reason for that. It's not because Massive, I mean, it's because they're cool or whatever, but it's because everyone wants to experience this feeling together and to like worship together. Not that you're worshiping those guys, but to like huh. come to a higher plane or a different plane of existence and all together as, as one people you know otherwise you just sit at home and listen to the record on your headphones right the communal experience is part of what makes it sacred I, absolutely for me i think for me anyway i mean i'm sure that there's also then you know the way with thomas merton the the you know he would just go off and be totally alone and have his sacred moments like, I, I don't think it's necessary. I think different people are, are different. And I think that solitude is a big part of spirituality. But I also think that a community of people praying in some way together, what, even if praying just means dancing together, is also a very sacred experience. Yeah. Tell me one more thing about your personal experience with sound and the spirit or God, or the spirits? Well, what comes up when you say that is, you know, I haven't been practicing enough, and it's really sad, um, because I'm <laughs> making this movie, and it's making me crazy. But, uh, but when I'm in shape on my instrument, and I'm playing with other people, there's this moment where you just, where I just switch off, and it just happens. And I think that's, pretty much the best feeling in the world you know like and then you know you look at the people who can achieve those heights all the time and it's just like i'm so inspired by them and you look at you know you look at the jazz dudes who are i think there there's so much heroin partly because that feeling of you've like wood shedded your ass off and you're an amazing instrumentalist but then you can just put it all aside and just let the spirit enter you and play like it's totally pure catharsis you know it's like better than any drug and then and then you go back to your crappy apartment and your promoter steals your money and <laughs> of course you're going to start doing heroin because you can't because normal life can't compare to that feeling and and i haven't had that many you know like maybe i've had like like probably less than 100 if i'm honest um but those, but I can like remember where I was and I can, and you know, it's for me, it starts to become very visual. Like I stopped really seeing, hear, hearing that as music and just like kind of these like shapes and colors start happening. And it's just like, and, and then if, of course, as soon as I'm like, wow, those are cool shapes and colors, it's over. They just snap out of it. <laughs> but those little, those little moments where the music is just happening and everyone's together. And, and I think for me, for sure, that's communal. Like, you know, I've like recorded music on my own with multi-track stuff and whatever. It never happens. It's when there's a bunch of people together, there's no ego and there's a lot of listening and everyone's just letting the spirit flow through them. It's like, mm. that is, that's, that's the best. Like that's the reason to live. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. That's the reason to live. And that is, I mean, that's what a, that's what a, a meditative experience is. I mean, that's what you're doing. You're, you're putting in the time you're sitting on, on your cushion to, the moment where you are in samadhi where you are in that place yeah and and then like you said as soon as you're like oh i'm not thinking i'm in a timeless space yeah yeah it's you're over. right back yeah right and so you go back to that practice to find that and and that's you know that's part of you know <laughs> I know people have these these ideas of, of meditation and it does take some time, but it doesn't take that much time. 
to get to where you can actually have that experience through that practice mm -hmm. too, you know? And I, and I know, I, I feel like as a musician, you kind of get, um, not a pass, but like a kind of a bonus because you do get to have that experience, mm -hmm. especially if you're doing improvised music or mm -hmm. if you're, you're playing with other people and you do put in the time. But I know, I know, you know, it's like so much of what you're saying is the, is the ritual, is the practice, mm -hmm. is of putting in that time so that you can have the space to receive that gift. Yeah, totally. And to be in that flow and that effort to do that. And, and to someone like Farouz, that, that that is so, there's so many chops in that. <laughs> there's not a single bow yeah. out of order. And her voice is so controlled yeah. that you know there's so much discipline yeah. and, and effort put into that transmission being allowed to come through you. Mm -hmm. But, you know... <laughs> I, that what you said about the hair, heroin, I, I, I thought you were leading to saying that then people, I, my assumption was that people would take that drug to then get out of the way to then while they were playing to allow. Oh, I think that happens too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wasn't around, but I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I've heard different stories about whether those guys were high when they were playing or whether, whether, whether they were at their best when they were high, you know, like I, I don't, I think a lot of it was to relieve the pressure of the shitty lives that they were leading outside of outside of that space. But I'm sure there's also a lot of great high playing going on. I have no idea. <laughs> but that's, you know, but to your, but that that's like a whole other thing, which is that like, you know, okay, so I don't know how much you know about Ramdas, but you know, he and Tim Leary were at Harvard. They took LSD. They were like, holy crap. We just learned more in like, well, they took psilocybin. They're like, we just learned more in like a weekend than we did in all of our doctorate studies of psychology about the human mind and the human experience. Mm -hmm. They went on this path. They had Millbrook. They took hundreds, thousands hits of acid. They did days and days of rotating. These people are tripping and these people aren't. These people are tripping. These people aren't. Sounds exhausting. <laughs> yeah. But the thing was, is that, so, but Ramdas's story, Richard Alpert's story is that he was like, wait, I always come down. Like there has to be a way to stay in this place. Like, why do I have to come down and crash and have this mm. horrible crash? Sends him on his journey to India, yada yada, meets our guru Maharaji, Neem Karoli Baba. And then the practice of, of love and service comes in. And that's how you stay high. <laughs> right. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> but that's a practice, right? Of surrender and of of loving and serving and remembering God. Mm -hmm. This back to your thing about fear and the practice of ritual. Like you have to show up, do the ritual, and keep moving through it. Right? Absolutely, yeah. 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 Practicing kind of sucks, but you got to do it for whether it's <laughs> meditation or music or religion or whatever. I think, I, I think that's part of it. Right. And that's the, but you know, to your point about your focus is now turned on this new film that you're working on. So this practice that you have of playing trumpet is like weak currently <laughs> it's currently weak <laughs> yeah. which is which creates though the longing mm -hmm. for that yeah which is also a part of it and who knows like maybe you'll find that space in a new way through making this feature film film doesn't do it though really no it, i mean <laughs> film's amazing i love it but it doesn't it doesn't do that same it's it, because huh. it, you know, like Nietzsche and Schopenhauer talk about music as the sovereign art, and I think that's absolutely correct. I think with everything else you're trying to do, you're you're like you're making a measurement of an idea, whereas music is the the pure idea. You know what I mean? Mm. So, um, so I just got to get back at it. But you know, I I, I just go in, in cycles. We just with my band, we just finished a new album, and I was sounding okay on that. So I'm not I'm not too worried. Tell me about that. So Bell Orchestra has a new album. Bellarcast just mastered a new album and it won't be out for the, another 
almost a year, I don't think. Oh. But, um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. It's one song. Oh, really? It's a, it's a one 40 minute song <laughs> album. <clears throat> and, uh, it goes to a lot, of, it journeys to a lot of different places and it's all, it's all based on improvised music, but it's not all improvised. And then what else is going on? You, you're working on this feature. Right. Which is being shot in? In Havana and Montreal. In Havana and Montreal. And when do you start that? On January 9th. January 9th. Coming up fast. And, and what else, is there anything else that we need to see or hear that has happened recently? I just finished a project that I'm really excited about called The Seven Last Words. Okay. Uh, based on The Seven Last Words of Christ, oh. which were the seven things that he supposedly said as he was dying. So, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. My father, why have you abandoned me? Uh, I thirst. Mother, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. Uh, it is finished. Truly will be with me this day in paradise. And I'm forgetting one. But anyway, <laughs> um, Joseph Haydn wrote a series. He was commissioned to write a series of sonatas based on each one of the seven words. In wow. the, yeah. In like 1780s. And... Uh, and it's super beautiful music. It's crazy beautiful. So, so I had this idea that, and it has always been performed in really interesting situations. Like the first time it was performed, it was at uh, in Cadiz in Spain, where where the bishop commissioned it, or the somebody commissioned Cadiz. And uh, what they did was they blacked out all the curtains except for one, and they planned it so that when the bishop would come and read each word, there was a beam of sun coming straight at him from the roof you know like it was like so it's like high drama performance since day one wow and i'm really good <laughs> friends with a, a string quartet in london and they were telling me about this and they were telling me that they wanted to record it anyway and i was like well what if we like brought that performance to an, a different place and so but i didn't want to make so so the idea was to make seven films to go along with each of the sonatas and to perform it with the live string quartet just a tiny little idea. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I didn't want to do all seven myself because I thought it was really important, especially since it's such a Christian thing. I thought it was really important to get seven different filmmakers from different backgrounds, from different, you know, ethnic backgrounds, from different religions to, to you know, tackle these themes because the themes are universal. They're not particularly Christian themes, the themes of abandonment, fear distress mortality like that happens to everybody um and so yeah i i wanted to get it out of the idea of christianity but keep this music and so we got seven amazing filmmakers and the movies were shot in iran colombia haiti louisiana um in the north of canada with in inu people uh, another indigenous filmmaker it's, it's kind of all over the place and the films are really cool with no sound design other than the string quartet. Um, and they, they go from uh, pretty documentary-ish stuff, but like lyrical documentary to extremely experimental films. And and uh, we had the Avant Première in Montreal a few weeks ago with the string quartet. We flew them over from, from London and it's it's awesome. It's so oh cool. man, I wish I could have been there for that. And But the idea is whenever possible to play with the string quartet and not just the soundtrack because it brings a whole different energy to the whole thing because it becomes it's as much a concert as it is a film and so it has that kind of sacred space of a concert and where it could derail at any time you know like usually when you watch a movie the movie's locked it's done the music's it, it you either like it or you don't but there's this feeling with that live element that's like so thrilling and also forces like a more intense viewing experience because people aren't gonna like cough and drop drop stuff and like eat popcorn in the same way because there's like a, an incredible string quartet playing 20 feet ahead of you, you know? right and so it, it, i've never really seen a movie like that where it had that that feeling of like sacred music and and then these images which are you know very intense images from all these different minds and spaces and countries and cultures i think I, I'm, I'm really happy about it wow that sounds awesome i really can't wait to see that and i want to experience it live and see that is what is the gift of having these multiple disciplines you know yeah. because which i imagine is as it is right now somewhat frustrating 
at times yeah. to feel divided between these two lives. Mm. But the gift of that is something like that where, where, where you're drawing that tension together <laughs> for all of us to experience yeah, and have that moment of suspension yeah. in sound and in the visual. Yeah. Wow. That's super cool. Kaveh. Well, that was awesome. I think I'm going to call it. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fun. <laughs>